Well, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us here at Bible Way Church of Sumter. We're so grateful that you have chosen time out of your schedule to be with us. Uh, I am so excited today to bring you the Word of God and to share with you the Word that God has placed on my heart uh, for the kingdom of God and for the people of God today. I trust and pray that um, this broadcast and this live stream finds you and your family doing well. Uh, and on behalf of our pastor and first lady, we send you uh, just tons of love and prayers and let you know that uh, we love you, that our prayers are with you, and that we are praying God's blessings upon you and your family as we continue to navigate through uh, these uh, trying times that we're in. Uh, we thank God for his goodness and his grace. Uh, it's interesting, God continues to show us uh, his, his power. He continues to show us his love and mercy. Um, throughout uh, the land and um, in spite of and in the midst of all of the things that we are dealing with. And so I want to encourage you uh, tonight, uh, just at the onset, to um, I know we're all dealing with our own individual challenges as we go through the economic challenges, the, the pandemic and the climate that's in our country. Um, but I want to also encourage you to not just to look on your own needs, but to look on the needs of others. There are people that are uh, much worse off than you are, perhaps, that are dealing with difficulties that you may not be dealing with yourself. But I want to encourage you to look out uh, for someone else and to reach out to a neighbor, a family member, friend or loved one, and just demonstrate the love of God to them as well. And we thank God that your life will be blessed as a result of that. So um, again, thank you, thank you. So we're going to move um, swiftly into the Word of God. I'll tell you, I am just uh, excited about um, what God is doing and that God continues to reveal himself. Uh, he continues to man manifest himself and to demonstrate his love toward us. And um, the Bible says that God demonstrated his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. So I thank God for his saving power. I would ask that you would um, like um, this uh, live stream and share with your friends or family, uh, share it with someone, even as we get ready to get started, that you would share with someone so that someone else can be uh, blessed and can benefit as a result uh, of the power of the Word of God. And so with that in mind, I want to open up in prayer as we get ready to jump into the Word of God. Father, we thank you today for this time that you have given us to share of your Word. We pray that the hearts and minds the ears of those that are listening will be edified and will be encouraged as a result of your word. We pray that you would speak a word that will challenge us, that will change us and transform us. God, we give your name praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So um, we want to get into the word of God tonight. We'll be, we're going to be dealing with the scripture in a, a context uh, from Acts chapter 5 uh, tonight. And it's... Um, uh, an interesting story that we, we're going to try to just really pull a couple of concepts out of that God has placed in our hearts to share with you um, on today. So I'm looking at um, how often it is that uh, people find themselves guilty of going against the will of God. God might have a desire for us, have a particular plan or intention for our lives. And if we're not careful, we can find ourselves fighting against God. So the, the, the subject, I guess, or the topic we want to deal with tonight is fighting against God. Fighting against God. That is the side of the equation we don't want to be on. Because I'll just tell you, I'll go ahead and give you a punchline early on. Uh, you're fighting a losing battle if you're fighting against God. Not just you, but anyone that chooses to do that is fighting a losing battle. So we're going to talk about fighting against God. And again, we'll use Acts chapter uh, 5. Um, and if you're uh, jotting this down, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42, is an entire context that I want to encourage you to read uh, those verses. I'm not going to read all of those verses uh, tonight, but I really want to encourage you to really see how God is moving in the book of Acts. It's a very powerful chapter that we can see the power of God demonstrated, the power of God operating in the early church. And so, uh, again, Acts chapter 5, verses 12 through 42, which is the end of that chapter. 
So we're going to talk about fighting against God. Um, during this time um, in Scripture, the church was operating under the power of God. If we go back into Acts chapter 1, the Bible uh, records the words of Jesus when he talked to the disciples and his followers, and he said that he told them that you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. After you receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, you shall receive power. And he said, you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and into the uttermost parts of the earth. And as Jesus shared that word with them and, and, and prophesied of the coming of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, in Acts chapter 2, we learn that the fulfillment of that promise came to pass because on the day uh, of Pentecost, that is recorded in the book of Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And the Bible says that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them utterance. And so we go into Acts chapter 3 where um, uh, the, the early church begins to operate um, in God, and we begin to see how God begins to move through the through the early church. And if we move forward to Acts chapter five, which is our context today, it started out with a little, um, uh, I guess, a little tension there because God uh, caused two people by the name of Ananias and Sapphira to lose their lives because they lied to the Holy Ghost, so they were dishonest to God through the men of God. They were dishonest, and it resulted in an immediate judgment for God. And that judgment was that they lost their lives. And right after this particular story happened, the Bible talks about how great fear came upon the church, or great awe. It was a sobering and somber time. People gained respect for who God was and the power of God. And as a result of that, the Bible goes on to talk about how many signs and wonders were done through the hands of the apostles. So here we see this, this spirit-filled church operating under the direction and under the anointing of the power of God. They begin to operate in the spirit to the point that signs and wonders were done. In other words, there were amazing things, things, were, things that were extraordinary. Things that were out of the norm were done by the hands of the apostles. Miracles were done. Uh, people were healed. Uh, there were great things that were done. Um, people uh, that uh, uh, were blind, their sight was restored. The lame were walking. Signs and wonders. In fact, the Bible says that this thing was so intense. The move of God was so powerful and so intense that they were, people were struggling. They were bringing people there and they just wanted the the shadow. I think one one scripture talks about in this book, uh, uh, chapter five. It says they wanted the shadow of Peter. They felt that if Peter's shadow just passed by someone, they would be healed. It was an awesome move of God. People wanted so badly to get in touch and to get connected with the move of God. In fact, the Bible goes on to say in this Acts chapter five that they brought people from surrounding cities brought them to Jerusalem because the word was out that God was moving in the city. The power of God was moving in the church. So much so that people were coming and they were bringing people so that they can experience the power of God. I want to pause right there and let you know that that is the same formula that it's going to take for revival in our churches today. We need a move of God, the spirit of God to have free course in our churches. And what the Bible says is still the principle still holds true today. When the spirit of God is moving, when the, when our churches are operating under the power of God, God will draw and bring those that are in need. Because if you think about it, the power of God in today's society is a solution to the problems that exist in the world. The power of God is the solution. And so anytime there is a solution, people want to come. We've seen it happen in our society. There's a giveaway or somebody's giving away something free or they're giving away. People flock to it. They flock to it because it's a, a solution to either a need or a perceived need. Well, in the spirit, when the power of God is operating in the church of God, 
God will cause people to come. In fact, Jesus said that if he be lifted up from the earth, he would draw all men unto him. And we see in this book of Acts was an example of people being drawn to the power of God that operates in the church. I believe that's a call to churches across this nation and around the world to get back to the real move of God in our churches. I believe that we have become a little weakened. We have become weakened by programming and we've become weakened by, by methods and by fads and a, by a tr trying to become worldly. I believe our, our, our bishop often says here at our church that we're living in a time that the, 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 the world is becoming churchy and the church is becoming worldly. For a church to become worldly, we, we forfeit the power of God that he promised to his church that we should be operating in. So when we move in the, and operate in the power of God, the true power of God, God will bring needs and he will bring those that need to get in touch with God. If the power of God is not moving, then guess what? I don't, I, I don't want to offend anybody, but if the power of God is not moving in our churches, we have nothing to give. We have nothing to give. The only thing that separates us from any other social entity in the world is that we operate under the power and the anointing of God. So when people come to our churches, they should expect to, to see a move of God. I say to those that may be unchurched, that may be unbelievers listening to this, when you go to a church, you should expect the power and the move of God. You should expect something from your church that you can't get from the world. God has promised something for the church that you can't get anywhere else. And so the church was operating in this power. And so here's what happened. Because the church was operating in this power, the religious structure, when I say the church, let me clarify. This was the first century baptized Holy Ghost filled believers. The church that Jesus planted, not the church that existed when Jesus got here, but the church that Jesus started. So now the Pharisees, the, the, the religious order, the religious church of that day, they were upset. The Bible says that they were upset and they, they were moved with indignation. The Bible used that in one of the words in Acts chapter 5. They were upset because these folks were moving under the power of God and people were getting healed. Watch how crazy that is. They were upset because people were getting healed. They were upset because people were being made whole, because miracles were being performed. The religious order of the church of the day was mad at the church, if that, if that makes sense. That's a, that's, a, that's a warning sign right there. If we are supposed to be representing God we should celebrate when God is moving. We should celebrate when people, people's lives are being transformed, regardless of who God is using. I believe we're living in a time today that there is far too much competition amongst churches. Who cares who God uses? As long as the will of God and the mission of the kingdom is being accomplished, then we should learn how to celebrate and applaud each other. Applaud the results we should celebrate the fact that somebody's life was changed for the better as a result of the power of God. So the power of God was moving and, and, the, and the religious order of that day, they were upset and guess what happened? They locked the apostles up in jail. They threw them in jail. So here's what happened. The church operating under the power of God and here's what happens, here's what happens to the Holy Ghost filled church operating under the power of God. Watch this. Persecution came. Any time there is a move of God, you can expect persecution to come. I know this is not something that, that gives you the warm fuzzies on the inside and makes you want to, you know, clap your hands and say hallelujah. I'm telling you this as a teacher of the word of God, that you have to arm yourselves and get yourself prepared. Because when God begins to move in your life, when God begins to, whether God is moving in your life as a result of you being a believer and God is using you and God is growing you, God is blessing you and his favors on your life, everybody's not going to celebrate it. Persecution is going to come. You might be someone that's not a believer. Let me tell you something. If God is moving on your heart and drawing you to him, 
people are not going to be celebrating you. Everybody, not, I'm not going to say people, some people will, but everybody is not going to cheer you on. There is going to be opposition, spiritual opposition, because the enemy does not want you to come into the family of God. So he's going to fight. He'll use family. He'll use friends. He'll use stuff, possessions to fight and block you from coming to God. But I stand tonight to tell you that you have the power of God on your side and working on your behalf. And greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. There is no weapon formed against you that can prosper. So God is stronger than any enemy. Let God arise, the Bible says, and his enemies be scattered. When the power of God rises in you, the enemy will come in. Persecution might come, but it will not take you out because you are covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm covered by the blood. Somebody ought to type that in, the, in your text box right now. Covered by the blood. Covered by the blood. The Bible says that it, the blood makes the difference. The blood makes the difference. So persecution came, and now here's what happened. Persecution came, but something interesting happened. When they were locked in prison, they were thrown in prison for doing the will of God. They were doing something right, and they received something bad. Thrown in prison for doing the will of God. But here's what God did. If you read in Acts, all of this is in Acts chapter 5. God opened the prison doors and brought them out. <laughs> Hallelujah. He opened it. So in other words, what the enemy meant for evil, God will turn it around. So you remember, I just told you persecution is going to come. When God begins to move in your life, negative things may come, but it's not the end of the story. You don't have to lose hope because just how God brought them out, God opened the prison. In other words, what the enemy set up as a trap, what the enemy used to try to bring you harm or to try to stop the move of God in your life, God undid it. He reversed it. He, he broke the chains. So whatever the enemy will bring, you don't have to become victimized to it. All you have to do is trust God because he's stronger than any weapon that the enemy can bring against us. So God opened the doors of the prison and he brought them out. Hallelujah. And it was miraculous. In fact, um, it's sort of interesting. I'm going to fast forward a little bit and I'll come back. But it was so miraculous how God did this. God opened the doors of the prison, brought them out, and they and he closed the prison doors back. And the ones that was guarding the prison, prisoners didn't even know that the prisoners were gone. How is that? How in the world that happened? God brought them out without the guards even noticing that they were gone. The reason I say that is because the next day, uh, the religious order of that day, the, 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 the church religious order that they went to, uh, to have them brought, they, say, they sent word to have them brought out of the prison. And when they went in the prison, the Bible says that they opened the doors of the prison to go in and get them, and there was nobody in there. So the, in other words, it, it looked from the outside, it looked normal. It was still locked up, the guards were there, but guess what? They were not inside because God had brought them out. God has a way of still performing miracles that will baffle the minds of those that brought evil against you. God will do it. We've got to learn how to trust God. So, so they, here's what happened. They were, they were, God opened the doors and brought them out, and God told them to go in the temple and keep on preaching. Keep on preaching Jesus. And guess what? They did what God said. Notice the progression. They were, they were operating under the anointing of God, persecution came, God delivered them, told them to go and keep preaching the word, and they obeyed God. They continued to obey God no matter what. That's a word for somebody right there. Continue. Please hear me. Continue to obey God no matter what. Thank you, Jesus. No matter what. No matter what. Type that in the text box. That's going to be an encouragement. I believe somebody's going to get a breakthrough. No matter what, no matter what the doctor's report says, no matter what your job said, no matter what's happening in the economy, no matter what, no matter what, God will continue to work on our behalf. We've got to walk in obedience, continue to obey God, even when, and especially when it's inconvenient. Continue to walk in obedience, even when, and especially when it's not convenient. 
So they continue to do the will of God. Now, when they continue to do the will of God, here's what happened. They sent for these guys again and brought them and said, look, we're going to kill, we kill y'all. They threatened them with death. I'm going somewhere. They threatened them with death. So you see the progression of what's happening. They continue to walk in obedience, and now here comes persecution again. They threaten them with death. So how now they're facing death. And so in the middle of this council, this religious council, the Sanhedrin council, the Bible says that they started talking about slaying them, killing them. We've got to get rid of these guys because they continue to disobey our commands and they continue to talk about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. People are still getting saved. People are getting healed. Miracles are being performed. Let's just get rid of them. So now Gamaliel, he was one of the members, one of the, one of the rulers on the council. And he spoke up and he says, wait a minute, time out. He called a time out and he says, you know what? Let me remind you all of something. There were two people that came up before in the past and they were not real. And we, you know what we did? We gave it time. There were, and there were people, I think one of them, they said there was like 400 people following them. Somebody that rose up and said they were some great person and there were 400 people following them. They said, you know what? And, and pretty soon they just sort of fade out. In other words, it came to naught. It came, what they were about didn't come to anything. It didn't produce anything. It didn't, in other words, it didn't last. There was no power in it and it faded out. And they said there was a second instance. Somebody named rose up, named Judas, I think it was. He said, same thing. It pretty much fizzled out. It was nothing to it. Why? Because it wasn't of God. And so here's what Gamaliel said to them. He said to them, he said, you know what? I'm going to warn the council. We pro if these men are not of God, here's what he said. It's going to come to naught just like the others. In other words, it's going to be a... Uh, it's going to pass by. It's going to fade away. If it's not of God, it's going to fade away and be nothing. Not going to produce anything. And here's what he told them. He says, but if this is of God, then we can find ourselves fighting against God. What wisdom this man had on this council. He says, we need to leave it alone. Because if God is with these men, we can find ourselves fighting against God. Interesting. Look at this. Verse 39 is where I want to draw in your attention and we'll have our remaining discussion. And Gamaliel, this is what he said in verse 39 of Acts chapter 5. He says, but if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it, lest haply ye, found, ye be found even to fight against God. Let me read it in the Good News Translation. Uh, the Good News Translation says it this way. I think it's very powerful. It says, but if it comes from God, in other words, if what they're doing comes from God, you cannot possibly defeat them. Wow, did y'all get that? Gamaliel told them, if these men are truly of God, you cannot possibly defeat them. And he says, you could find yourselves fighting against God. And the Bible says that the council followed his advice. We're talking about fighting against God. One of the interesting points that I want to make is you remember uh, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, that later was named Paul. Saul was one of the students of Gamaliel, and it is believed that Saul was likely present during this time that Gamaliel told them, don't fight, the, don't fight these men because if they are of God, we could be fighting against God. Saul was the one that wreaked havoc and persecuted the church. So guess what? Here's, I want to, I want to make a point here. Saul was present and heard that warning from Gamaliel that he made to the council and the council agreed and they heeded his advice. But Saul went out and did not heed that advice. He witnessed the words of his teacher, but he didn't follow him because the Bible goes over in Acts chapter uh, eight and nine, uh, it talks about, uh, actually, in chapter 9, 8 and 9, I think it does, it talks about how Saul wreaked havoc on the church. He persecuted the church after hearing the warning from his teacher. 
he went out and did not heed the warning. There's a danger of fighting against God. And you know what happened? Here's what happened with Saul. Because he did not heed the warning. The Bible says in Acts chapter 9 that he was on his beast. He was on his way to persecute Christians. And the Bible says that a light came from heaven, knocked him to the ground. And it said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Jesus said to him, Saul, why are you fighting me? He said, it's hard for you to kick against the prick. I'm going to tell you today, there's many people today that are fighting against God. God's asking that question to so many people today. Why are you fighting against me? So fighting against God. So many biblical examples. I'm, I'm think, I think about Pharaoh when God told, uh, sent Moses to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And God uh, 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 sent Moses. Moses spoke the word to Pharaoh. Pharaoh um, uh, rejected it and refused to let God's people go. And the Bible says that he sent plagues, plagues of at multiple plagues uh, against the nation of Egypt because Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. He refused. In other words, he continued to fight against God. There's danger of fighting against God. Listen here. Let me wrap this up. How foolish it is to think that you can fight against God and win. I don't care who you are. It's a foolish thing to think you can fight against God. Satan himself, when he was Lucifer, tried it and it didn't work. It's a foolish thing to think that you can fight against God and win. Powerful scripture. I want you to write this down. Act, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 45. Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 9 and I'm just going to look at the A clause at the beginning, just the first part of verse 9. Isaiah 45 and 9, listen at what it says. Woe unto him that strives with his maker. Woe unto him that strives or contends or struggles or resists or fights with his maker. In other words, with God. Woe unto anyone that chooses to fight against God. So my question today is, are you fighting against God? Are you fighting against God? That's the question I want you to ponder and consider in our remaining moments. Are you fighting against God? Are you, are you holding open doors that God wants to close. Think about it. Are you fighting against God? Are you, um, are you holding on to something that God wants you to let go of? Think about it. Are you trying to fix something that God is telling you to take your hands off of so that he can fix it? God knows I've been guilty of that. Lord, I, I, can, I can handle it. Trying to work it out, trying to fix it. And God is sitting back waiting on me to take my hands off of it so he can work. In other words, I was standing in God's way. Are you fighting against God? Are you resisting a, a pull or the direction that God is trying to lead you in or lead you to? Are you resisting that? Are you fighting against God? Don't be on the wrong side of that fight. Don't be on the wrong side of fighting against God. Because eventually, just as Saul, Saul heard the warning of, Nick, of, uh, of Gamaliel, but he didn't obey it. And guess what? Because he didn't pass the test, he had to keep taking the test until he passed it. Eventually, he surrendered to the will of God. He could have saved himself and avoided a whole lot of pain, a whole lot of suffering, a whole lot of discomfort had he surrendered to God and not fought against him. Jesus said it's hard to kick against the pricks. It's hard to fight against God. When you fight against God, you're only hurting yourself. You're only prolonging the will of God for your life. Stop fighting against God. Listen, sometimes... Sometimes I think, 
I, I think we need to understand the importance of not fighting against God, but sometimes I think we are we're wanting God and asking God to prepare blessings for us. Sometimes we think God is preparing the blessing for us, but I've learned that in many cases, and I, I believe in most cases, God is not preparing the blessing for us. He's preparing us for the blessing. Did y'all get that? He's preparing us for the blessing. Because if you think about it, if you look at scripture and you look at kingdom principles as it pertains to scripture, the blessing is already prepared. It's already prepared. God is preparing us in most cases for the blessing. Yes, he is. Thank you. Here's a reality check for you. God often places your blessings on the other side of through, through, T-H-R-O-U-G-H. He often places our blessings on the other side of through. That means he prepares us for it. We have to go through a process to walk in the blessed place, to walk in the place that God has designed for us. Are you fighting against God? Be careful. Don't be on the wrong side of that fight because God loves you with an everlasting love and he has, he has good intentions he has thoughts of good and not of evil for each of us. And I thank God for the power of his word. And I pray that God's word will be rich and real in your life. And that God will get the glory out of your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord, as you have given us the space and the place to share your word. We pray, God, that our hearts have been encouraged by the sharing of your word. We pray for every one that's viewing this stream, this broadcast. We pray for the blessings of God over their lives, over their families. We pray, oh God, that your word will continue to establish us, to settle us, and to strengthen us as you conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. God, we thank you right now when we plead the blood of Jesus over every attack of the enemy. We plead the blood of Jesus over every yoke. We pray, O oh God, that you will send your anointing and your favor and your grace to destroy the yokes. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. God bless you. God bless each of you. Again, we thank you so much for joining us and for tuning in. And we pray God's blessings will be upon each of you. We have just a couple of quick um, announcements we'd like to share. Something that we... I uh, had planned to mention this past Sunday and it slipped our minds and so we apologize, but we are super, super excited uh, to announce uh, uh, the newest member of our church family, uh, the newest and uh, perhaps the youngest member of our church family now is baby Madison Tomlin, baby Madison Tomlin, who's the, uh, uh, the, the newborn of Chappelle and Aretha Tomlin. Uh, the ba baby was born on July 6th. July 6th. So we welcome baby Madison uh, to uh, the world and to Bible Way. Uh, and so we're so grateful and congratulations again to Chappelle and Aretha on uh, their bundle of joy. We can't wait till we're able to see you guys again in person. And uh, we certainly are praying for you guys and we love you guys with the love of God. Um, our Kids Connect will be, um, will be uh, going live shortly at 730 Eastern Time. Our kids connect tonight, so we certainly want you to encourage. We want to encourage you to have your kids join us for our kids connect again uh, at 7:30 Eastern tonight. Um, also, just a reminder to all of our youth, uh, to the parents of our youth, uh, just a reminder about the activity that's uh, being planned for that is planned for this coming Saturday. Uh, please uh, make sure um, that you uh, make a note of that and that we are reminded of that. This coming Sunday is Fourth Sunday, which is our Youth Sunday, and God has given us a, a message uh, to share. Uh, with our youth. So I want to encourage all of our young people to please uh, tune in on Sunday and invite your friends uh, to join in. And uh, for our parents that are listening, I want to ask you to invite, uh, make sure your kids are reminded to join in on Sunday. We have a special uh, message that God has given us to share uh, with the body of Christ that we think will be a blessing to them as well uh, in the name of the Lord. So continue your faithfulness uh, in prayer, your faithfulness in your financial support to your local church and certainly to the members of our church. Uh, we thank you so much for your uh, faithfulness, your continued faithfulness 
uh, in your prayer and in your financial support. And so we, um, we thank you again for joining us and uh, we pray that God's blessings will be upon you. And uh, if not sooner, we'll see you guys hopefully um, same, uh, uh, we'll see you on Sunday morning. I was about to say same time, same place, but we'll see you Sunday morning, same place. We'll see you at 10 o'clock Sunday morning and we pray God's blessings upon you in Jesus' name. God bless you until we shall meet again. Thank you.